Our reading this morning will come from Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us. We thank you for your love and care for us, for the adoption that we have received, for we know that we are truly your children, and that you give good things to us who ask. We pray, Father, that we will always appreciate and love you as our Father. And we eagerly await the return of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we are considering the basics of what we believe over the next several weeks. And so for those of us who are already Christians, we are reminding ourselves of these basic truths that all the rest of the truths rest on. But for everyone else, you might think of these things as a primer on the Christian religion or as an on-ramp into the Christian religion. And hey, just as a reminder, this is a very good opportunity if you are not in the habit of doing so already. It's a great opportunity to invite friends or family, neighbors, co-workers uh, who are, uh, express any kind of interest in the faith to come visit for worship, because we're going to be going over some of these very basic things over the next several weeks. But last week, we talked about our most bedrock belief. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And most of our time last week was spent considering why we believe in one God rather than in many gods or rather than in no God at all. We talked about what we mean when we call God the Almighty and why we call him that. And we talked about what it means for God to be creator of heaven and earth. Right, but if you were paying attention last week, you probably noticed that there was one part of that confession that we did not talk about. The one more key aspect of this confession uh, that deserves much more time than we could have given it last week. And something that begins to explain the appeal of our religion. Not just why we believe, but why we enjoy believing. And it's that we believe in God our Father. When we say that we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we're saying that God is a person. That's, that's not necessarily an intuitive idea, by the way. There are a lot of... We, we talked last week about polytheism. Or not polytheism, pantheism. The idea that God is bound up in all of the created order. That the universe is God, basically. Uh, to pantheists, the idea of a personal God this is not necessarily intuitive. Well, what we confess is that the creator of the universe is not some mindless abstract force that is behind everything or within everything. We believe that God has a will 
that he is actively engaged, not dormant or neutral. We believe that he is knowable as a person, not unintelligible. We believe that God has an identity and that he has revealed himself to us, his creatures. He's told us who he is. And out of all the ways that a personal God could reveal himself to his creatures, we believe that God has revealed himself to us mainly as a father, our father. I think he has at points compared himself to a mother as well which will go hand in hand with everything that we're going to say this morning. But the vast majority of the time that we find him describing himself, he does so as a father, our father. So we're going to spend our time together this morning considering what that means and how we see it come across in our religion. Well, the first thing that it tells us is what kind of creator God is. God didn't just create the universe. He created all of this as a father. And that means that the universe is not cold and indifferent to us. Rather, it's our home. It is crafted for us with love and given to us by our father. In our reading this morning, Jesus invites us to think about how a good father acts. He says, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? All right, you want chicken nuggets? Well, here's dirt nuggets. How about that? All right, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? When we confess that we believe in God the Father, we're saying that we believe that God loves us. In fact, the Apostle John just tells us simply, God is love. Uh, Once in 1 John 4, 8, and again in 1 John 4, 16. And that's why we find this pattern in the creation account of Genesis 1. Last week we talked about one of the first things that, that our Bible confesses to us about God is that he is creator of heaven and earth. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 1 again. And you might know where we are going with this. But there is a theme to this creation, something that becomes apparent pretty quickly as we read the creation account. And it starts right away, right after we read that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And again in verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, And God saw that it was good. Verse 11, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Again in verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. 
And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. Guess what God saw? That it was good. Verse 20. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm each according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And again in verse 24, God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Because God is our Father, because He loves us, He didn't just make any old universe. He made things that are good, good for us. I want us to cap off the creation account here. Now that we've seen God create all of this stuff, and he looks back on, on each and everything that he makes, and he sees that it was good. At the conclusion of all of this creative activity, we get kind of the purpose of it. This is not just another act of creation that we're going to read about. It's, it's the pinnacle of his acts of creation, and it is the act of creation... Honestly, it sums up and explains the rest of the acts of creation. We read in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Right, God not only makes us in His image, but we learn just immediately after that that God creates us to give us dominion, lordship, over all of the other stuff that He had just created. Why did He create all that other stuff? To gift it to us, His creatures. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you. All right, some of his first words to mankind are words of giving. All right, it's, it's Christmas in this verse. I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. All right, this is the, the conclusion of the creation account, the pinnacle of God's creative activity. Again, the point of all of the rest of the creative activity. He makes all of these things on the first five days to give as a gift to us on the sixth day. He looks back over all of these things and sees that it is very good. This is the kind of father 
He is. Now, this is the kind of thing that we mean when we confess we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Y'all ever think he could have just made a universe completely made of mayonnaise? I don't know, maybe you're a mayonnaise person, but that's a nightmare to me. Instead, he gave us a world that has bacon in it and golden kiwi. I mean, just, hey, we said last week that sometimes atheists take too much for granted. Well, I think maybe we, we probably do too. You ever just think about the simple stuff in this life, like how good it feels to take a, like a ice cold bath after working really hard out in the heat? You ever think about you know, just how good certain foods taste? How nice it feels to have coffee? Like that's, God loves us. He is our dad and gave us these things. We wake up every single day and get showered with all kinds of little treats. The point of the, all of this confession is that the Christian religion is first and foremost a religion of hope. Because where there is love, there is hope. And it's important, I think, that this is among the first things that we confess about God. It is one of the first things that we confess, period. Because this is the foundation for everything in our religion. We commonly call Christianity's core message the gospel. That word gospel means good news. Good news means that we have something to look forward to and something to hope in, something to feel good about. We have reason to take courage. It means that everything will be all right in the end. All right, Paul explains this to us in Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 14. Paul is proclaiming this message of hope, and he ties it to, or grounds it in, the love of God the Father. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now, this brings us to another thing that we mean when we confess that God is Father. Because you might think, well, with all of this talk about God being the creator of heaven and earth and making good things and loving us, being almighty, what do we mean? What does Paul mean talking about suffering? 
When we say that the Christian religion is one of hope, well, wait, you know, why, why are things bad now that we need to hope in something for the future? Well, when we say that the Christian religion is one of hope, we're not saying that it is one of ease. Is we should consider another thing that fathers do. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 3. It's written, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wearied when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children, not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which, there, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Because God is our Father who loves us, he disciplines us. And we don't just mean that in the punitive sense. The Bible doesn't just mean that in the punitive sense. The, the word discipline does not primarily mean punishment. And this, this is a good lesson for us fathers and mothers, anyone who is involved in disciplining somebody else. If you spend the, the entire course of your discipline only punishing, don't expect to produce good fruit out of that. What discipline means is working towards growth and maturity. Punishment is sometimes part of that. But it is so, so much more than that. It's what, what we often call upbringing. The thing that results in you being a stable and happy person. A person whom we would call an adult. Right, because not everybody who has attained the age of majority is an adult, sadly. I mean, we know that. We've met people who are that way. Upbringing, a good upbringing, results in a mature person. And we believe that God is interested in that for all of us. We believe that God is our Father in the way that He instructs us and brings us up. And that's why the passage that we just read in Hebrews ends with this call to action. Lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees. And it gets very specific. 
Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. And Hebrews is far from the only place in the Bible that talks like this. All right, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. But beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And notice John starts with promise there. He starts with good news. But that leads into a call to action. If we call ourselves children of God... If we are waiting on that adulthood, that maturity that he has promised us, what we will be, as John calls it, if we're waiting and hoping in that, John says, we will purify ourselves as he is pure. It's a call to action. And this is where we begin to identify Christianity as a religion as a set of definite practices, things that we do, things that we don't do. And this is, of course, where Christianity starts to become unpopular. Because one way of framing our religion is as a matter of listening to our dad. Those who are outside of the Christian religion are sometimes like you know, those neighborhood kids who balk at what a fuddy-duddy your dad is. Your dad doesn't let you do this or that. Your dad doesn't let you eat five pounds of nachos. Your dad doesn't let you, you know, play in a flooded culvert. Your dad's just such a stick in the mud. Or in the case of us specifically, it's stuff like, your dad doesn't let you get drunk. Your dad doesn't let you sleep with whoever you want. But my dad lets us do all that whenever we want. It's so much fun. Your dad's terrible. Here's the thing, discipline is not just for the young, it is for the wise. That's the way that Solomon frames things in Proverbs chapter 1. We'll read the first nine verses of Proverbs 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight, to give instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. The one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Most people who have had a good upbringing can look back on it and recognize when their parents were right. Uh, this is it's part of wisdom. Wisdom to stick with the discipline even when you don't understand it, and wisdom to then later, once you've matured, look back on it and understand it. Right, many people who were brought up poorly, just they lack the maturity to look back and understand how their fathers failed them by not disciplining them. But if you were brought up well, 
Now, maybe you didn't understand as a child why you were being brought up the way you were being brought up. Maybe you didn't like your upbringing at the time. Maybe the other kids you knew had more fun, whatever. But with maturity, you gain a little perspective and you come to understand and to appreciate that upbringing. And we believe that humanity's relationship with God works in a way that's similar to that. God, our Father, is operating on a level far above us. The, the gap between us and our Heavenly Father is way bigger than the gap between, like, nine-year-old us and our earthly fathers, all right? And in our present childlike state, we might not appreciate our upbringing. But Christians confess, as a matter of faith, that this upbringing is for our benefit and that we will enjoy the fruits of it as we mature and that it will lead to something, something grand. This upbringing is just further evidence of God's love for us. Just look, mothers, fathers, is discipline easy? <laughs> This is hard, isn't it? It's a lot of work. If I didn't love my children, I would not bother to discipline them. This is a pain in the neck. The discipline that God puts us under is proof of our value to him. And this is a big part of what draws believers to the Christian faith. And why we cherish and enjoy the things that we believe. You know, a lot of people think of religion as a burden, as trouble. We invite you this morning to a religion of hope. We're not inviting you to a life of ease, but we're inviting you to a life where the trouble makes sense and the trouble points forward. We are inviting you to the love of God the Father to receive and acknowledge the gifts that we are given in everyday life and to grow, to mature, till we reach what Paul calls full manhood, is to be spiritually adults. We're inviting you to what John talked about in 1 John 3, what we will become when our Lord appears. The fullness, the, what we might call adulthood in its fullest sense. So we urge you this morning, if you have not done so already, believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Turn away from the sinful ways of this world. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and live faithfully under the discipline of our Father who loves us. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.